Thank you very much. Matt, awesome. Fantastic talk and a fantastic you know, background because I'm going to talk about the same things. It's, it's always about the same things. Flow, habitat and connectivity. These are the three pillars of fish recovery. And this is the things that Matt talked about. So, and, and we often talk about environmental flow and we think that will solve it. And we talk about habitat and that will solve it. We'll get more native fish back. And we talk about fishways and connectivity. That will solve it. You need all three. If you get one message out of my talk, don't forget that. You need all three. You won't solve it with just flow. So these combine as well. And I'm going to talk to you tonight about how flow and habitat combine to give us river hydraulics and what that means for fish. When we think of flow, we think of volumes and discharges. And you often hear about megalitres per day or gigalitres. And that is the major measure of flow. That's how we manage rivers. I want you for a moment to imagine you're a fish in a river. You don't sense megalitres per day. You don't sense gigalitres. What do you sense? You sense the slightest change in velocity, the slightest change in turbulence. You also have a fantastic sense of smell. If you ever see a cod up close, it has this flared nostril and it's totally it's scooping in water the whole time. So this is what fish respond to. It can smell when flood water comes up from 100 kilometres away, but it's smelling, it's sensing velocity, turbulence. This is what's happening to fish in the water. And I'm going to talk to you about hydraulics and how we get better hydraulics for fish. So imagine this is a river and it has no habitat in it. And what you get is just this really uniform flow. You get these velocities. They're very, very uniform. But when you add habitat, it changes. And everything starts to mix up. And you get fast velocities, slow velocities. You get velocity refuges, turbulence. And this is called hydraulic diversity. And fish love this stuff. And lots of aquatic animals love this stuff. And importantly, this is occurring at the same flow. So you haven't asked for any more flow. Flow hasn't changed. You just added this structure. You added habitat. And this is what it looks like. And we know when we arrive at a stream like this, we think, wow, we know this is good for fish. You don't need any labels. You don't need any science to know this. You look at this and you think, this is fantastic. Slow velocities in the side, fast velocity down the middle, behind those snags, velocity refuge. Those aquatic plants on the side provide roughness, really low velocities. You get different aquatic insects in there and you start to get a whole different food web. So these flame water habitats, these are absolute key nursery habitats for Murray cod. You can catch Murray cod in a range of habitats, but the juveniles do really well in these flame water habitats. And silver perch is the same. And this is where you get their, their best survival. And trout cod and Murray crayfish, you get the best populations in these flame water habitats that are complex. They've got rocks, they've got snags. This is where you get the best populations. But it's not just fish, actually. You get different crustaceans, different snails, all the way down to plankton. You're getting a whole different suite of aquatic animals when you get this flame water, this complex hydraulics. This gives you different diverse food webs. And this gives you a healthy river ecosystem. There are three key impacts on hydraulic diversity. Obviously, if you take out the habitat, you're going to take out that hydraulic diversity, so putting the habitat back is a huge thing to do. Low flows. Now, low flows are a natural part of rivers, but when they become lower than natural and extended for long periods of time, you're losing that hydraulic diversity and you're losing fish populations. So what happens with extended periods of low and zero flows? Well, I'm not going to show you all those horrible pictures of fish kills, but we've seen some shockers in the last 18 months. But it's not just fish that are dying. 
It's also snails, there's also river mussels. Those river mussels are actually, they grow for about 30 years, some of them, as old as Murray Cod. So there's been massive mussel kills and snail kills along the Darling. So we're looking at a whole ecosystem here that's been impacted. And it's been impacted because of the extended periods of low and zero flows. So it's a big impact. These guys, like flame water, like Murray Cod juveniles, like silver perch juveniles, they require this flame water. Some people are out there saving the mussels. So it's not just fish Oz fish are saving, they're saving these guys as well. The next impact, the third one, are actually weirs. So weirs impact hydraulic diversity because they just slow the velocity down. And, there, and most people here would know what a weir pool looks like on the left hand side. This is one on the Lachlan River. That same flow going over that weir creates this lovely flame water habitat downstream. And you look at that habitat and you just know that's going to be fishy. And of course the weir pool has just slowed it all the way down. But we know there are solutions to these impacts. So Matt has talked a lot about restoring habitat. That is such a fantastic thing to do because you, you, you think you're putting physical habitat in, but you're actually creating this hydraulic diversity as well. The low flows, we need to actually rethink how we manage rivers and base flows. And I have another talk where I'm going to talk more about this, especially about the Darling and the Macquarie, about base flows and what that means. But it needs to be enough to create this flame water habitat to sustain fish and prevent blue-green algae. And the third one, the weirs, there's a few aspects to weirs. Number one, we actually need to protect the flame water between the weir pools that we've already got. And when people go fishing, and they look for that flame water, we need to protect that now. We don't want any new or higher weirs. We don't want to create more pool habitats and start inundating that flame water. So we don't want to do that. That will be going backwards. So you might, you might want to add habitat to that, but if you've got a weir pool, it's not going to be as productive in terms of breeding native fish. But really, this also gives us a new opportunity to remove or lower weirs. Now, many weirs are critical infrastructure. Town water supply, yeah, they have to stay. But there are some weirs that have lost their function. In that case, we should think about removing them. So the example I'm going to give is the Murray. The lower Murray here, this is uh, you know, kilometres from the sea down the bottom up to Hume Dam, 2,000 kilometres up to Yarrawonga, an elevation on the left-hand side. The lower Murray is just a series of weir pools and they were put in for navigation for paddle steamers. They're not used for storage. And right up to Hume Dam. Now what we have here, actually, you think the Murray River is, is a long way away, but as Steve and uh, Matt said, our rivers are connected. And what's amazing is in big flows, you still get fish migrating a long way. This is a tag silver perch from Lock 3 in the fishway that went up recorded Mungani in 2011. A massive migration. So, so these fish, as Matt said, really love to move. That's absolutely incredible. So we're talking about the Murray, but we're talking about fish that are moving all over the place when they, when they had the opportunity and fishways improve that opportunity. But here in the Murray, that flame water habitat, the only remaining habitat is between those weir pools there, and that's where you find trout cod and Murray crayfish. And a whole bunch of other things, you get good cod populations. This reach here is probably the best silver perch population in the basin. So I'm just going to have a close look now at these lower weir pools, and they are like this, back-to-back -back weir pools. Now, what you can do, or what you have got at the moment, is very low Murray cod populations, low biodiversity, but what you can do, if you lower that weir, you will start to get that flame water back. So all you've done is load or remove the weir. It's the only thing you've done. And now you get more native fish back, more biodiversity, but the key thing here is you haven't even done any extra flow, and actually, strangely, you gain flow because there's less evaporation. So you've recreated fish habitat, and you have to remember that these are weirs that are not used for storage. This is not like some of the weirs in the Darling, which are critical. 
these weirs were used for navigation for the paddle steamers. In the drought, they never drop down. So they're not used for storage. So that's a huge you know, potential. So I've talked about these three, you know, these pillars of fish recovery. It always falls into these three categories, and you need all three. Don't think you're going to solve it with just one. And how that combines river hydraulics and how we need to protect and restore river hydraulics. But I wanted to say one really important thing. I, I've been involved in fishery science now for over 30 years. The science behind this in the last 20 years has accelerated. This is absolutely rock solid. You provide these three things and you can guarantee native fish will recover. And that's an important message, you know, because we've seen some bad, uh, bad fish kills. But this is completely achievable. These three things, rock solid science, you get native fish back. And so you'll get lots of adult native fish, but you also get breeding of native fish. So you get small fish, and then of course, you'll get other small body fish. You get diversity of fish. So that science is absolutely rock solid. So I have one conclusion, one line, and it is that rehabilitation of fish, fish populations is completely, utterly doable. And I'll leave it there. <laughs>